One of those games industry heroes that was actually key for us in surviving and pushing until now, uh, a, a games industry veteran that you, most of you well know of, is now going to take the stage with a morning keynote. Here is Hendrik Lesser, president of EGDF and CEO of RCP. Hey. So I'm also very happy and thank you, Damia, for giving me the opportunity here and the whole team of Reboot to give a political talk. Uh, we are in special times, in my opinion. This is a bit unusual to do this in front of a thousand people. I normally do this in front of 50 who are like, yay, super interested, and so on. But my topic of today is a call to arms to defend our democracies and become what I framed a digital culture warrior. So who the fuck I am? That's me. I'm a nerd. I started playing games when I was four years old. Um, I studied philosophy with the Jesuits, um, some history, political science. Uh, talking about identity, right? Because I think it's very important. I'm a bit Indonesian, so I'm a little bit of an, an Asian guy. I'm a Dutch guy, so I have a colonial history. I'm Silesia, which was German and now is Polish. And my other grandfather is a Prussian, and I grew up in Bavaria. That's already five different identities. And besides this, and this is why I put it there, you know, being a nerd, being a game maker, loving games, loving comic books and all this is very key to me and this also helped me form and build and kind of shape my identity. And obviously you can see it's all kinds of things, always also interested um, in the military and in history and all this as I mentioned. And that's very important to me. What else do I do besides um, what Dami mentioned, doing some politics with the GDF? I run a company called Remote Control Productions, where the purpose of the company is to help studios and empower them and ultimately make them run their studio as best as they can and with their still being in the driver's seat. And we do this all over Europe and in Pakistan. So a little disclaimer. I'm here as a private person. I do not represent EGDF and that is moment in my talk, right? This is my personal opinion. And um, this is a very complex topic. It took me only just a couple of decades to come to these ideas. So I will simplify, I will exaggerate in all this. So I hope you give me a little bit of leeway on this. So in my opinion, we are at war. As a German, I feel at war. I think there's so many conflicts going on, wars, whatever you want to call them, I ultimately call them war. Um, we have brewing conflicts uh, really around the world and we obviously have the war in Ukraine which is in Europe in my opinion and is a horrible crime and is really, really affecting us. Why is that relevant to us, you might ask? You know, we make games, we are business guys, whatever, we have our own life. Why do we really care? I think that's under threat. I think at the moment, with the narratives coming from countries like Russia, but also others, right? You know, they have a different idea on what life and how we are together, how we build communities uh, should look like. And I think it's very important. To me, democracy is not negotiable. It might be not the best form in the, on the planet as in perfect, but it's still the best thing we came up with as a human species. It's trying to have everybody have a say, to have representation. To me, it's very important that we have something like a rule of law. Russia is not a democracy. We all know this, right? You know, they, they had referendums on 97%. Who the fuck believes that shit, right? You know, that's, that's fraud. And that's fraud out in the open. And I think it's really, really high time to say this out loud. We want to have free arts and speech, right? You know, this is in games too. This is very important to us. And um, we come from all kinds of different countries and something like free speech is, you know, in regards to laws is very different. I come from Germany, as mentioned, right? For quite a long time, we were not really allowed, it was not, never really a law to use, for example, swastikas because of our history, right? You know, we started World War II, horrible crime again, um, and we had to deal with it somehow. Just recently, a couple of years ago, a game changed that because a game tried to depict basically what would really happen, try to be historically correct. And everybody was wondering why are they not allowed to use it if it's, you know, if Indiana Jones can do it, right? Which is definitely not a history pick, right? So I think 
free arts, free speech, privacy, you know, this is, no one of us likes GDP fucking R, right? This was a, as a pain years ago to implement it. Now actually, and you know, I'm more than happy to say it here officially, it's a good thing. It protects European data and other data because international companies, if they want to do business in Europe, have to adhere it too. That means, you know, and I know this is a fact, for example, a company like Tencent buying a company in Europe, they can't look in the privacy data of the employees. That's a good thing because you don't want to end up in, you know, a Chinese app being, you know, have a little algorithm telling you in the end what your social score is and if you are allowed to, you know, board a plane or not or enter China even as a European. And inclusivity, right? We've been talking for many years about diversity, having more people in the games industry and so on. But ultimately, it's not just about the games industry. It's, it's about our whole societies, right? It's about being open on what your identities are, whatever it is, if it's from a sexual, religious, I don't really care, right? You know, this is, we have to allow people to ponder and find out who they are. So obviously there's many other values you can put up there, but to me, especially the, the democracy, the rule of law, that's non-negotiable. So I think we all have to care. So diving a little bit into my statement that we are war. Classic war is like what we, we all know from games, from movies, from history books and so on. Conventional war is mostly physical, you know, space, cyber. Cyber is of course less physical, but it's still like uh, more or less the conventional war, trying to destroy military, right? The Americans destroyed the, the Iraqi military and won the war, they thought, right? And then the war started, because then the unconventional war started, which is way more important in the last decades. You know, there's been uh, still discussions going on, how to define this, what's irregular war, unconventional, whatever. A lot of it is semantics. To me, it means and this is also basically why we should be care, especially as gaming, it's about the hearts and minds, it's about disinformation, the setting narratives, is what, what they also call the psychological operations and all this. And saying it again out loud, right? You know, the Russians are very good at this and they've been doing it for a long time and other countries have been doing it too. Um, you know, this is until 15 years ago in China, nobody was really allowed to make sci-fi stuff because sci-fi was difficult. How would China look like in the future? Most of the sci-fi back in the days were dystopian. How can it be dystopian in China and all that kind of stuff? Why did it change? Because they want to go to the moon. They are now a high-tech uh, country. They basically want to have ideas for young people to strive for, right? Six, seven years ago, there was a good uh, piece on The Economist basically saying, in the US, people want to become influencers. In China, they want to become astronauts. Who do you think is going to win? And this is funny, but it's also very serious. Because again, it is what I think, it's about the hearts and minds of us. And that is primarily done on the virtual battlefield. So who are we? When I started philosophy, and of course nobody really knows, we at one point just said, right, we are third our DNA, we are third our own free will, and the rest is the environment, you know, our families, the people, and so on. And to me, to reaffirm this, it's two thirds of it is hearts and minds. That's a lot, right? So a lot of our identity is actually shaped here and in the heart or in the gut or whatever you believe in. And if that's true, and this guy, which I normally don't really like, the orange blip, but Basically, all games are political. And why are all games political? I know that it's been discussed, right? Many, many times um, in lots of games and should X, Y, that company, looking at my friend to, you know, who worked on Assassin's Creed with Yubi, are Ubisoft games political or not? All games are ultimately political. The same is true as all games are culture. Are all games art? Hell no. Are all games having a political intent? Definitely not but ultimately they shape our thinking. And that is really, really important to understand. And for us as people, unless you are you know, a little bit uh, uh, disturbed or something, right? You know, we are social human beings. We are what's called in Greek, so on politikons, right? We are political entities. So why not aim for a cultural victory? 
This is, to me, all my life I've been playing games since I was four years old. My whole thinking is shaped by games. When I think about my company, when I think about strategy, I think about civilization. How I won a game 20 years ago, what did I do, and all that kind of stuff. And I know that for a lot of you it's the same. You dream of games. You play a game, you're stuck, you go to bed, the next day you're like, I know how to do it now. Because your brain is so influenced by it, and it has such a deep and profound effect, in my opinion, as a heavy user, right? I'm an addict, so... Uh, that, in my opinion, let's aim for a cultural victory. And I mentioned it already, right? Games are not only culture, they're also the culture technique of the century. Let's see, you know, still early in the century, but at least, you know, for the last couple of decades and for the decades to come. You all know this, that, you know, until, whatever, 10 years ago, uh, it was basically, yeah, we copy Hollywood. I don't think that's really true for 15, 20 years. When I watch an action movie, I see where they stole the theme from a game. And, you know, this is not only the Marvel Universe, which kind of revolutionized Hollywood, which is super nerdy, right? It's very close to us as gaming people, comic books, in my opinion. Um, and there's many, many other um, examples, too. So I think we have a responsibility to take this shit serious. And we don't need to take it serious every day and be all, you know, anal about things and whatever. But, you know, we have to think about it. We have to ponder it. We have to discuss it. We have to debate it. We have to, you know, fight over it. You know, ideally a con constrict conflict resolution afterwards. But ultimately, I think that's what it is. So games are many things. And, you know, I browsed again a little bit, read a lot of books over the last 30 years about that. And I just put them up here. They're not complete, but they're entertaining, they're educating, they're also indoctrinating. If you play a game for hundreds of hours, your brain starts to adjust to the game, right? Your neural network, will, there will be an effect even on the game. You know, we, we know easy stuff from advertisement. You know, advertisement you saw as a kid, fucking Fruit Loops or whatever, and you heard the jingle a hundred times. I, I still sing it to my wife sometimes, right? Just because, you know, it's a funny situation. So we also have to acknowledge games are great, but they have, you know, things you can do which are more kind of going to the dark side too. And that's totally fine. I think 100% of what humans doing always have a flip side too. And they are very social. So, talking a little bit about reality, and I hope you don't mind that, you know, I try to explain this too. I try to, be, to make this logical. I make, to try to make this obvious that everybody really, you know, sees this perspective. You don't need to understand. You're totally entitled to have a different of opinion. But please try to follow um, the kind of uh, line of thought here. So, if we basically have these experiences, the emotions, the experiences are real. To say, you know, this is real and game is not real, it's what I learned, doesn't make any sense. Both are real. We don't even know, you know, I don't even know if you exist, right? We can have that conversation too. So, but without going too deep, one is a virtual reality, the other is a physical reality. Both are part of the reality. You know, this is, uh, I don't know who of you played online um, RPGs back in the days or still do, right? You know, maybe some of you found your new partner there. I made friends there who I never met and we played for two years and then we Ultima Online back in the days, right? Where it was still a new thing in a way. Um, and I met these guys two years after only ICQ. You know, that was the, were the days. And these were my real friends. And it was such a weird feeling, right? To meet a person you've never seen, we never spoke on the phone, only ICQ playing Ultima Online, and it felt like this is my true friend. I can rely on that person because he helped me defend against the PK, and then we all died, and all that kind of stuff. We share these narratives, we share these stories and these emotions. So, what's the meaning of this? Who recognizes the reference? Yay, a couple. So no peppermint um, after this. Because what I said before, that this is serious and that we have to take it serious, it also is like 
Again, how is this connected? And to me, it always comes down, and I love this fucking movie, and I talked about it yesterday. And um, by, the, by the way, funny little anecdote here. You remember the movie, right? And they have the discussion very often in the school about what's the difference between a civilian and a citizen. You know what the Germans did? Because they were, the original book was banned as doing too fascist. In the German translation, they said, what's the difference between a soldier and a civilian? Which is kind of, you know, pretty obvious, right? But asking the question, what's the difference between a citizen and a civilian, is much more interesting. In Starship Troopers, and it's not what I'm advocating at all, you're only a citizen if you have been a soldier before, right? That's the Roman style, where you have to serve 10 years, and then you basically really consider it um, a citizen. But in my opinion, we all have to ask ourselves these questions. All of you are educated. We all come, not all, but lots of us come from a kind of more privileged side of things, right? Again, not saying all of you. And what do we give, to quote Kennedy, right? What can we give back? What can we do for the country? And this all sounds, you know, a couple of years ago, a lot of people would be saying, yeah, whatever, man, you know, this, this kind of cynicism. Again, we are at fucking war, right? You know, in my opinion, where the world is going to over the next decades is at stake at the moment. And not at this particular moment, but for the next years, and always has been for the last decades. And if you think of some of the more, um, let's say, threatening candidates in the world, um, it's even longer. So think about what it means to you, what you can give back to your society, to your country, and all this. And I'm very happy that we have the privilege to not, you know, I have to give my blood to the country and blood and honor and all that kind of stuff. You know, I thought we left that behind as a human society on the planet, right? That we can have discussions somewhere else, but unfortunately, we don't. So, what can you do? Who recognizes these kind of things? No one knows what NAFUs are? The little Chiba dogs fighting back trolls on social media? That's me, right? Thanks to Boris who made it for me. So, I think it's, it's, it's time, high time, right? And it was already clear a couple of years ago and the kind of potential re-election of Trump to not let it stand anymore, to not let your friend, your family say outrageous, wrong, false, disinformation, racist, whatever kind of shit. It is time to say enough. This is bullshit. Um, sure, you can explain, you can be analytical, you can try to basically reach whatever their personality they are, try to persuade and so on. But I think as a citizen of today, you have to say no to this. No, whatever it is, your values, right? I hope they're not like fascist, for example. Um, but they basically draw a line. Don't be in the gray too much anymore. It's not the time. You can call out this information, as I said. You, this is, um, here, the guy um, I'm hugging with, Damir and me, went to dinner. It was, I think, the deputy culture minister of Croatia or something, right? Um, and this is important. We have to tell people who are not part of our industry, who are either politicians or other you know, leaders of societies, if they're entrepreneurs or in the social field or whatever, it doesn't matter. If they're not knowledgeable of what we do, we have to fucking tell them. Who else would, should do that, right? We can't just rely on a couple of journalists doing it. And there are good, some good journalists out there, but you know overall journalism is pretty fucked since decades, right? They don't really have a great monetization model. In gaming, there's less than a handful really serious people who can do investigative research and all this. And I'm not saying that the rest of the journalists are bad journalists. Again, not the point. But how the, the systems are working, I think, is much more difficult. So we have to do that. And educate yourself. And no, I'm a big Urso fan, right? I think he's one of the coolest characters of Star Wars of all time because um, I can totally relate to this. He thought in the beginning, right, you know, he's not a fucking Jedi or anything. Um, he believed in the idea of the Empire to bring order and security and all this. And then over time he understood that it's just becoming a fascist regime. And then, you know, he's instrumental to destroy the Death Star, right? I hope you all saw the movie. But this kind of struggle 
is not black and white, and this is what I'm talking about, right? And at one point in time, this guy wakes up and he said, it's enough. And I'm going to destroy my life's work and probably kill, how many people were in the Death Star? A million or something? I'm basically kind of co-responsible for this because that is better than a fascist regime dominating the universe. And it's very tough calls if you think about it. And, you know, we're glad it's just fiction, but to me, Star Wars is beyond that, right? Yes, it's more than that. So, don't work with the dark side. Don't sell your company to some of the countries I mentioned. I'm, I'm not a fan of selling your company to Russia. I, I think China might unfortunately be next. I hope it's not. But there's a big, big risk, even if I just look at it technocratically, right? If you sell your company now to China, there might be a problem in two or three days. Might everything be fine, right? I have lots of friends who did that and are totally happy. So I'm not dissing Tencent as a specific company. I'm dissing the idea of selling to a company out of a country which has a very different point of view on how the world should be run. So work with them if you must. Um, that's fine, right? You can still split it up, but, but I'd understand even if you don't agree from the kind of moral perspective, that is just the risk that there's going to be sanctions, right? When the war started in Ukraine, a lot of companies adjusted to this and it took them lots of effort, right? We all know this, I, I think, right? I have lots of friends who were kind of airlifted out of Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and, you know, it had massive disruptions, right? Give money to good causes, have a positive attitude to a team, create awareness, never forget, right? You know, this is this, this idea for many of these kind of um, psychological operational um, kind of goals is also to distort the, the past, right? So that certain things are completely depicted wrong. Um, and, you know, a lot of stuff, again, is not black and white and it's in the gray area. But I think it's still relevant to at least acknowledge the facts. And police and protect your communities. I already mentioned this. This is, it's, it's fine to be a liberal. I'm, you know, in my normal days, I'm a progressive liberal too, in a way, with, you know, lots of mixes from, like, stuff from the more communist side of things, if you really, you know, political scientists, right? So I really dived into the shit. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff which is actually, ding, uh, more social is better than ultra-capitalism, my opinion, right? Another example, right? Damia mentioned EGDF. It's a little brag minute. Look at the date and look at the time. We were able with the European Games Developer Federation, which has 20 countries as members, as associations, to post this an hour before 11 bit on the day of the invasion. And we had a two page document and I'm so proud of it because it means we have a healthy organization representing developers' interests in Europe and also have the guts and the understanding, and this was totally a collaborative effort, to share a statement, you know, basically hours after the invasion started. So also, ideally, be a little bit more interested what we do there, right? We talk to the guys in Brussels, and I know it's fucking boring and it takes forever and then everything, right? I know this, I'm doing it for more than 10 years. But it is necessary, someone has to do it, and it would be great if all of you care a little bit more about regulation and because it also involves freedom of speech and what we do and who we work with and what's okay and what, what's not. So talking a little bit about games themselves. And, you know, I had to cut some slides. I had so much more examples. But ultimately, what I think you guys should think about more and have a little bit more intention behind it, provoke their thinking. Papers, Please is absolutely a great game. I hope all of you played it. If you didn't, it's a small game. Everybody can still play it. Um, it's probably just a couple of bucks. Go check it out. One of the best games with political intent of the last, how long is it ago? Maybe 11 years. I don't know. Remember. Make fun of dictators. I worked on Tropico, right? Um, that, that was a funny thing. But also Wolfenstein, right? Which has been such this controversial game for decades. The last two ones, especially, you know, the first one of the new era was awesome. And 
It was very kind of controversial and provocative and crazy thoughts in there. It was really a courageous political game. And you're saying this after, you know, one of the oldest memes of gaming of mindfulness, killing and Achtung, Achtung, Schnell, Schnell. You know, this is, I think it's just a great achievement. Make games with uh, historical context where you learn about things, right? I played Waterloo when I was, I think, 13 years old and I played it uh, as long as I actually won with Napoleon um, and beat my own uh, guy, Mr. Blücher uh, from Germany. And that teached me a lot, right? You know, how warfare worked, you know, also the tenacity and all this and a little bit of fun. It's, a, you know, it's not the best game on the planet, but it's a fun little thing. Um, prepare them in a way. An extra shout out to this one, I even have the t-shirt, right? Um, I think this is one of the best games of the last decade in regards to if you are interested in what politics could mean in a game and all this. How the narration works, how the characters are set up, what they do in the game is fucking interesting. And it is, you know, it's very clearly coming from a mere lefty point of view, but they go through all the different political theories and they discuss it in an intelligent, fun, Weird, druggy, love the drugs, by the way. Um, and it is, it's just awesome because it opens your mind and it shows you that there's different things. It's just, you know, even if it's fun, but save the princess might be a little bit of an oversimplified story. And talking about this, even if you don't want to go into the dark things and be depressing and, and all those kind of things, do fun games, do wild games, or you just feel great and you feel great to be alive, you, you, that you're a human being. Or, you know, Animal Crossing. I wanted to first put a, a little picture there of my wife when she fell asleep during COVID playing the game. It was the pinnacle of she feels cozy, it's nice, you belong, it's great, everybody's sharing on the internet, it's like in this crisis, awesome, right? This is one of the COVID games, right? You know, Among Us, Fall Guys, um, there's a couple of COVID games which sold extremely, in my opinion, better than under normal circumstances because they basically resonated with all of us in a situation of crisis. And even if you go, you know, when I played Doom, I'm not fully sober, I had this kind of super flow experience, right? Where it was just awesome. And you know, flow is when you, comp when you ride the wave of, it's not too crazy difficult, but it's difficult enough, right? It's not boring, it's not frustrating. You just ride this wave. And that's, you know, if you achieve this, which is of course also very subjective, because all of us have different skills and different preconditions, kind of um, conditioning culturally and all this. But I think if you achieve this, this is awesome and shows that you can be happy to play a game. And of course, the good old escapism, you know, you walk with your alter ego, you spend, I spent nearly 200 hours in Witcher and Skyrims and, and whatnot, and it's just, you know, it's, to me, it's uh, you know, one of the, the latest um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, I was like, I, I'm on holiday. You know, just, I played it over the Christmas season. I don't need to fly anywhere. I'm just, you know, on holiday. And that's great, right? Do games where you make decisions, right? Ideally, and I know this is very difficult to really do meaningful moral decisions in games, and we've been discussing it for decades, and Chris Crawford is still sitting in a cabin thinking about it. And <laughs> so it's try at least. Talk to a guy yesterday at dinner who wants to do something there too with AI. You know, I have to do this. But push it and try to do interesting stuff. Show how fucked up war is. I will never forget Call of Duty 2, Russian campaign, you don't get a fucking rifle. The guy is just telling you, run up the hill. That's the moment where you feel, even in a game, that war is fucked up, right? You, you're the runner for some other guys to grab ammunition, and then, you know, 10 minutes in, you get your first weapon. And, of course, you go wild and start killing people, and before it's just, you know, pure survival. This is not a moment where you feel, yeah, I'm this great soldier, you know, I'm a super soldier. You feel vulnerable, you feel that it's fucked up. So let them suffer. This war of mine, also one of super cool, awesome game, right? You can't really win the game, right? Even if you win it for you little three guys in, in this house, you will have stolen food from others. You will have, have kids knocking at your door and you will tell them and send them away. 
So this is not black and white, but it gives you this profound feeling of epicness of, you know, this is serious shit. I don't want to be in this situation in a physical world, but, you know, enjoyment is the wrong word, but you are on this ride, you have this experience, it is meaningful to you. And even games like Company of Heroes, and I don't know if you remember this, Company of Heroes 2, for example, was banned in Russia because they depicted the commissars shooting at the guys who wanted to flee. And the Russian politicians of today said, that's not true. Uh, okay, there's thousands of documents about this, so it is definitely true, it did happen. And just, just you don't like this anymore, you know, this is now, um, I'm on, on Twitter, as, as you saw, with NAFU and all this all the time, so I'm totally down the rabbit hole of the war, right? And there's been more than enough reports on this. Or do something like more of a serious games, right? Serious games don't have to be frontal teaching and, you know, you're just sitting there and, uh, and that's it. You can make them interesting. Games, if games are the culture technique of the century, use them also to help people get educated about serious topics. And something like democracy, is a vital and serious topic in my opinion. And I found one of my uh, good old uh, games I really liked is something like Crusader, where you fight the power back, right? You know, you, you part in this game, you're part of like a fascist regime, and you're a super soldier, and then you kind of wake up, you start fighting for and with the rebellion. What you shouldn't do is shit like this. Don't make games which the one is hatred, right? I, I don't think that there was a great take, and I'm very liberal, and I watched all the crazy horror movies as a teenager and all that kind of stuff. So I went down that road, right? But if you just make a game which is only about violence and how crazy you can do without really narration, what the fuck are you doing? To me, that's not do, being productive in the world, to be honest, right? And, you know, this is if you're young and a teenager and want to provoke and do some crazy shit, be my guest, right? But, you know, if, ultimately, I don't think that's a great intent. And I mentioned Call of Duty as a good one too, but the last Call of Duty, I was that close to report to the German age rating authorities because it's too much. They distort history. You know, there's little movies of uh, German soldiers fighting Indian soldiers in the jungle. Uh, excuse me, that didn't happen. So they, they even form, going back in time, these adversarial ideas of identity, which I'm not a fan of at all, right? Um, and on the other hand, it is fucking brutal. If you do the finishing uh, moves in a, in a shooter game, why does it need to be like in Mortal Kombat? Now, if I play Mortal Kombat, I think, you know, one of the reasons we play Mortal Kombat is to see that, right? You know, this is, you buy the game, you're an adult, you want to do that. But Call of Duty, and you all know this, it's not only played by the 18 year old, it's also played by the 12 year old because it's a fucking huge game. Why do we have to celebrate violence like there's no tomorrow? And I don't know if you know this, Syrian Warfare is a, is a strategy game out of Russia where Assad is the good guy. Sure, Assad is the good guy, you know, didn't, didn't know that. Um, and of course, then the, the Russian troops coming, they're like, yay, we're doing this together, everything's awesome, and so on. It's actually, it's, it's a good game in regards to mechanics, but in my opinion, it's a very flawed game in regards to the messaging and setting and all this. And it finally, I think after two or three years, it got pulled up from Steam which I'm not 100% sure of how I see this, because I think it would be even better to keep the game in the store and do like a commentary and say, you know, this is not how most of the world sees it, but it's an interesting piece of it too. And I unfortunately forgot the name, I only have the, it's very small. Um, it's what we call our heart kind of a propaganda game, right? It's a full-blown Chinese-American war thing, right? Where the Americans are the enemies and so on, and you're basically getting trained to kill Americans as a Chinese soldier. And it's very much in your face, so this is why you probably never heard of it, because, you know, you're not gonna buy games where this is the narrative normally in the West. And there is definitely a whole realm beyond just what we normally call the entertainment side of the gaming. You can do America's Army. I think you all remember this, right? It's basically a recruitment and a little bit of a kind of pre-training tool for the American Army. And you can think of the Americans whatever you want. And I have a very, you know, a lot of things the Americans did since they exist is not great at all, right? 
but at the moment, in my opinion, they're the best ally we can have. You know, who else should we rely on mostly um, to kind of, you know, send weapons and train people in Ukraine to fight back Russians and the Russian army? And as you can see, games are already, and for decades, a reality in gaming. It's not just through VR and everything. You know, this is, there's been very um, early on in the war, there's been new trainings for Ukrainians in basements, how to shoot um, Panzerfaust and stuff like this. So it is actually having a real effect on this war. Our stuff we do has already an effect in regards to technology, how we do it, how we make it fun, and all this. And on the bottom right, it's uh, something from Slytherin. Great respect, right? To me, Slytherin is the um, less production value paradox in a way, but still really cool, right? They do very hardcore strategy games. And they started making this as entertainment games. And now they work with, you know, the, the Marines, with NATO and all this to make educative games for officers to basically have war games, right? The traditional war games where you basically play through scenarios to understand better what could be done. So, little summary here. There are many ways on how to change your mind. Make people feel good and connected. Create myth. If one of you also is able in his lifetime to create kind of a mythical game in regards to the intent and how it makes people feel and adapt and change, I think you achieved a great thing. Push for narratives with positive uh, values and mindsets, and also counter narratives from the dark side. Develop strategic content, which is the new word in political science for decades since propaganda, you know, had not a great time uh, 70 years ago, but it's basically the same, right? And help the other domains of warfare with trainings. So I ultimately, in your mind, want you to think about this. Why can't we change the world? If we are the culture technique of the century, us going to war against these other mindsets of fascist, authoritarian, and so on, I think, and this is something I told my parents when I was a kid, right? I, I said to them already, I think that's going to be possible because to me it already works. It already works that I feel more connected. And even if I beat you in a shooter, you know, and scream at you while doing it, afterwards we have a beer together. I don't have any emotion left to punch you in the face. And I think this is even getting more likely in the future um, with all kinds of immersive tech. So be what I call a digital culture warrior. Have a courageous mindset. Defend our values make better games, save the world, and don't fight and die in the process, right? And this is our privilege that we are on the physical side. We only go to physical heaven, right? Uh, to, um, sorry, to virtual heaven. And um, also a little thing, this is streamed, this is different. I normally give these speeches in front of 50 people and not to, to an opening, but special times. So again, shout out to the Reboot guys. So please share this. I know that not everybody will agree. I'm fine with it. Add to it. Send something back to me. We do a little raffle for the Star Destroyer because I play with the dark side, but I'm not part of it. And I think even if some of it sounded like a little bit like, oh, this is too much and too much, you know, I'm totally influenced by it, and we, we saw it the last seven months. Zelensky is giving speeches all the time. I think he went through all the historical relevant speeches multiple times now on how he basically addressed, uh, and this is obviously, who knows where this is coming from? Yes. And I think we have to think about this too and have the same energy. Please add me on LinkedIn, on Reddit, on Discord, on Twitter. Twitter only if you're into, you know, me shouting at you know, Vatniks um, for the moment. Let's see when that stops. But um, I'm more than happy to have more discussions with you guys. And um, I hope you took something away of it. I don't want to be too preachy, but to a certain degree, I totally want to because now it's the time. And um, so be a cultural digital warrior and Slava Ukraini. <laughs>